some patients. So as you know, there are quite a number of proposals. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them, uh, but we are going to go through uh, probably about six or seven of them. So I'm covering the first one, uh, which is the copyright registry. Um, everyone here is familiar with copyright? Okay, so one of the things about copyright is that there is no requirement to register. Uh, that means you don't have to fill up a form, you don't have to stand in the queue, submit something to someone to say, I've created copyright. Copyright attaches automatically upon creation, upon uh, reduction to tangible form. Uh, the idea here is to have some kind of registry. Okay, so before you jump uh, to what kind of registry, uh, just think about having a copyright registry as a concept. And some countries have adopted uh, copyright registries, the most famous being the US copyright registry. Um, few other countries around us, I think the registries are Japan and Malaysia, but I think the US copyright registry is uh, the most established. Um, so in the US copyright registry, people would submit their registrations uh, to the registry to say, I've created this work. Now, those of you who are familiar with IP creators in the States would also know that they have various other practices. So, for instance, musicians in the old days will <coughs> record their music on a cassette tape, plumb that in into an envelope, mail that envelope back to themselves so that they can get their tape with a date stamp by the US Postal Service. Uh, that they think would help them prove uh, that they have copyright in that particular piece of music in case someone then writes a song with a similar theme, etc. Uh, another practice that has evolved over time uh, in the US context is the submission of books to the Library of Congress. So everyone wants to submit their books to the Library of Congress, they would even uh, then state in the publication details uh, that their book can be found in the Library of Congress. Okay. So, the suggestion in Singapore uh, is to have this copyright registry. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why a copyright registry would be... Let me just get this. My phone. Uh, a copyright registry would be useful. One... Uh, people are people have a habit where you know unless they see some kind of documentation unless they see some kind of thing that says that they own the copyright uh, they feel unease so a registry allows them to somehow fill up a form and say that you own uh, a piece of intellectual property that is copyright um, it may provide some clarity uh, in then establishing ownership because, hey, you know, I've got a certificate. Uh, notice I use the word may because we'll talk about some of the issues uh, that then go on. Uh, possibly where there is then a dispute, you know, I did this, I did, I did this first or, you know, I, I came up with this before you did. Uh, maybe the registry could help resolve uh, some of those issues. Um, it will also help if, let's say, uh, the work was done a long time ago uh, the authors uh, are no longer to be found, uh, that could help them trace the ownership of that piece of work. So the way IPOS has uh, done this consultation is that they've thrown in a series of questions uh, that they're hoping to get some answers to. Um, we are proposing to answer them. We don't have to answer everything. Uh, we don't have to necessarily agree with everything. Uh, so let's see how that goes. So first question, do you think having a copyright registry would be useful? And do you think a, what do you think a copyright registry would solve? Do you think a copyright registry would solve it? Okay. Um, as I said, this is a consultation, so I shouldn't be doing all the talking. Um, anyone out there? My, my two cents would be the cost of running this who has who has that. And also, how do you keep it updated? And uh, yeah, the, the whole series of things when you start to run something. Like this. So before we go into the, the the operational details, the question is: Would something like this help? 
in the software context, so for those who write software, uh, a registry is sometimes good, especially for the open source software because you don't mind putting up all your source code and you know exactly who did what and who's holding what. Uh, the proprietary folks will have a slightly different issue with that. Uh, so they wouldn't be, uh, they may not be too hot about this, um, but for the rest of us, what do you think? One thing that can be, could be very useful to see what is the experience in, in countries that are having, say, this tool. How is the cost? I think that the, all the organization is quite big in order to maintain this registry. Okay. So, and for Mexico, I mean, we, we have a registry in Mexico, and it's quite, so it's not exactly needed, but yeah, yeah some artists are. But some artists are really having the feeling that they have something, mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, and we know, we know when something is in a challenging position, yeah. um, this is not, doesn't mean it's anything. So it's, maybe it's too expensive mm -hmm. from my point of view. So we can revise the experience of the model. Okay. Mm -hmm. Feedback from two aspects. One, as a former in-house counsel in a media company, that when we had treatments of film ideas and we had them as abstracts, we <coughs> registered them with the US Copyright Office because we wanted to go into meetings with US movie studios and we, didn't, we wanted to have proof that we were the original creators of these film abstracts, <coughs> the boxes. So that was useful mm. for the company. Second is also industry practice? Um, apparently, yes. Okay. It's apparently, it's industry practice to do that. And then the... How prevalent is that? I mean, is it industry practice in the US only? Or in the, the well, I mean, it makes sense if you are doing work in the US. Uh, so we needed to be able to go into a meeting with a film studio and later come out and they won't be able to make use of the story idea without us because we already have proof that we created it earlier. Um, second hat, as a musician and music educator, it helps it's in a way easier than doing the recording onto cassette and sending to yourself. Although nowadays, what the students are doing are uploading to some cloud or YouTube and using that date stamp as an indicator. So nobody knows themselves stuff anymore. Uh, from what we hear, the closest registry to us is the Malaysian registry. Um, but we are told that the Malaysian registry only has hundreds of registrations so far, which is a really, really small oh, number. Okay, so a couple of years. Considering that copyright you know, attaches naturally, everything is a copyright. Right? Uh, that's a very really small number. The, the only people who have been registering, uh, I think, were people who write uh, local um, stories, mm. uh, very localized people. So. so I guess the question that is pending here would be, uh, if I don't put something in a copyright registry, mm. if there is one, mm. am I at a lesser, uh, am I at a disadvantage long term, or is it a choice that I can have? Uh, whether I put it or I don't, I still have the same privileges, same, same whatever, right? So uh, that that would be a question that needs to be answered here as well. So I was at the um, seminar organized by IPAS and MS, SME and Ningo, and to answer your question, um, there is actually if you don't register it, you know, you do not lose copyright. Yeah. Really, basically, the registry just enables you as a mechanism for you to effectively date stamp your copyright and to trace who the owner is. And it was interesting because at that seminar, at best, when we took the vote, people were lukewarm. A lot of people felt that this was adding more bureaucracy, particularly when IPOS said they were thinking of a charge of fifty to hundred dollars per registration. So it can add it can add up to a lot of money if every iteration of a work, you know, you're putting it in. No, I don't believe it. It's not intended to be mandatory. It's purely optional. So I was at that same meeting. Um, I think the sense was that uh, the intention, as we said, was to give the benefit.
granted a certain evidentiary presumptions to be valid. The question becomes, if you have that, then what's the point of, uh, I mean, you know, is that going to cause a kind of a race, right, to get registered? Because people might be thinking, if I'm getting registered, then you know, I, am I at some kind of a disadvantage? And, you know, I mean, I, I fully understand Ben's point, but the thing is, there are today, if it's really just about proving that the work was in existence at a particular point in time, there are other, there are other ways of doing that, quite apart from establishing the registry. I mean, you're right. The way I look at it is that you know, larger corporations would not have any difficulty, you know, um, showing evidence of the creation of the work. It's really sometimes the the sort of creators, the individuals. But the issue there is, are they prepared to pay that sort of fee? You know, every time they want to register the work, that's the, that's the issue. And I think it was actually intended to assist the sort of individual creator more so than corporations. Mm -hmm. I registered the copyright in the US, I won my dissertation, and I was like, you want to register or not? And I was like, you know, why do I register? Like, oh, you need to sue somebody. You're doing a sucker, I start signing up, but I'm not seeing anybody yet. <laughs> no, I, I, I did the same thing too, but I, I know, it was just done. You just get a piece of paper. It's a form, right? It's just a form. Yeah. It's just a form. form. Yeah. yeah, such a form. It's so easy. Yeah, but I, I don't know where, where it is now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> It's only you know prima facie, mm -hmm. so it can be yeah. rebound, yeah, the best prima facie. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular situation or issue that uh, has has brought this about? I mean, this discussion of the registry, uh, proving copyright is that a perennial problem that, that keeps recurring? Because it didn't it didn't seem as though uh, that that was something that was particularly problematic. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm raising this is because. The amount of effort, cost, and time needed to put together a registry um, simply just to create a system to date stamp copyrighted works. Uh, I mean, it, it just seems to be a lot, considering that there's no real prejudice that's being suffered by uh, the creators at this point in time. Okay, so overall, if we take a vote, do we think a copyright registry will be useful? I'm mindful of the time because we have several other things to do. So, I personally would say I, I'm not in favor of it because it just adds an additional bureaucracy for potentially additional costs. Okay, so we unless it's a completely self-service, you know, at, at no cost, then sure. absolutely, and, and it's not obligatory, it's not mandatory. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Mm. So shall we vote? Yeah. So 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 the the result of the vote would be what. Okay, do we uh, do we think that it is useful? How many say yes? It will be useful. One. Okay, so it is the answer is no. I thought you said it would be useful for why it's free. Well, I mean, I personally think yeah, but the caveats are not placed there, so. Okay, do you think a copyright registry will solve the problem? Okay, so that's not that's unnecessary. Already. Okay. Mm -hmm. 1C, are there any other problems that a copyright registry might help to resolve? Anybody has views? None that we are aware of. Huh? No, I think it's I think that it's some issues of certainty, uh, some help of evidentiary side, but it's not conclusive, but certainly some help. But I mean, yeah. Issues of... But has there been issues of that nature? I think uh, one... Sorry. Uh, um, hi, hi, sorry for the delay. Hi. Um, I think one which we discussed the other day at the, at the round table was um, it will create a it will allow us to create a, a register of registrable transactions. So will that help, um, you know, in, in, in exploitation of copyright? Like, you know, for trademarks, there's a register of co registrable transactions, assignments, licenses, etc. For copyrights, there is no such register. So it may help. To, to, towards that end. Oh, so maybe we have a register of 
transfers rather than a register yeah, of copyright. Not both. No, no, you both. You don't register so, copyright as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the idea is, if I want to license, you know, a photograph, I don't know who the author is or the owner is, and if that person had registered, you know, I can go to the register and find out and try and secure a license. Well, this one I have concerns with that, that it's linked to the fair use mm. issue, because the, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but if you look at the fifth factor, the whole point of that is whether how accessible it is, mm. and even if you take it out, if we have a registry, then it may impose a burden on anybody who wants to use something to go to the registry and check and go through everything. And depending on how mm. the registry is structured, it may become a bit onerous for somebody who wants to use something uh, under fair use. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I, I'm worried about yeah. the I'm saying that once we have a registry, then that's something else that you have to do. Another step in due diligence. Yeah, and it is there, and you don't do it, and it doesn't mean that it's not fair, because it, that may factor into consideration. Okay. So that does bring up the question of Creative Commons type of licensing. Yes. Right. So if you have a Creative Commons, then you don't have to check with anybody. It's stated there already what you can and cannot do, and end of story. Yeah. So there's nothing onerous. It's there in front of you, yeah. per mm -hmm. per work that has been done. So that addresses that straight away. Uh, if you use, if, if you if you if it's a Creative Commons way of doing it, looking at things first. Mm -hmm. The way it is done today, we don't have that as a means at all. Yeah, but the Creative Commons licenses are usually, uh, I was talking about online works, usually mm -hmm. with the online works, you can just go there and it's just that, so you can see it. But for any works that's registered, mm -hmm. you don't know how you go to go so, so, like even printed ones, right? I mean, if you have printed, you can put your uh, yeah. uh, Creative Commons uh, yeah. tags there, mm -hmm. so that's. Yeah. But there's a different mm. issue. I mean, the Creative Commons, we definitely, I'm, I'm sure most of us will support you know, people using Creative Commons license. And that makes it easier. Yeah. It removes a lot of these requirements. Yes. Mm. Just in context, the CC license is automatically just a licensing framework. Yeah. This is a registration issue. Mm -hmm. It relates to having a source of reference to establish chain of title. Yeah. They admittedly, the, the, the mechanics or the mechanisms available today for checking chain of title and copyright is problematic today. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's not a big problem. Sorry? It's not a big problem. No, it is problematic in the sense that there's no central contemporaneous record mm -hmm. for this kind of thing. But uh, at the same time, what then has happened is that if if you are going to examine chain of title, you will go back then and start asking, do you know the most the, the, the most recent owner? Where did you get the rights from? And then you go back through this all the way up. So and then you get covenants, uh, covenants to Yeah, and then you get covenants, that's right. Mm -hmm. right. Covenants, covenants are not that big covenant, warranties, but, uh, yeah. it's there. You know, it, I mean it's not as if without yeah. this you everything grinds to a halt. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, with this, yes, to that extent, if it is something which is totally you know, nothing which compels you to do it, then uh, I guess no harm, but you can't end up with situations where there are presumptions and things like that which will then cause this arms race problem that we talked about earlier. Can I call for a vote again? So, 1C, do you want to, any other problem you want to solve? <coughs> Majority will carry. Do you still want to, okay, who still wants the registry? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want it for myself, but I see some benefit. Okay. Next question is: Should a title or registry? Okay, this is rendered redundant because we are not yep. having a registry. Do re registration should give presumption of validity, so also not relevant because we are not having a registry. Okay. Okay, next one is um, Do you have any views on the re recording of rights and dealings? It's already been raised by Angkor And then um, So, since we are not having the registry No views Okay, no views, okay, that settles that Next one is employee <coughs> Proposal 6, let me see, Proposal 6 
is exceptions that cannot be restricted by contract. Oh, by the way, I'm Brian Jeff. And so let me just sort of back up a bit on fair dealing, section 35 in general. Um, as you know, copyright is the term is 70 plus, life, sorry, life plus 70 years. And it really is an economic incentive that's given to creators to create work. And that gives you a monopoly for that period of time. Now, the trade-off is that even though you have a monopoly, you need to also give society access to this work. And therefore, within the Copyright Act, exceptions are built in. So education is a clear example, and news reporting. And then you have defenses under Section 35, there are five elements. And these defenses are what we call open-ended, in the sense that there is no, um, the court can consider any use to be fair, but it is required to take certain factors into consideration, which we will go into later. Now, you can even have um, fair use for commercial work, even substantial copying can be considered to be um, fair use. So how this now dovetails with Proposal 6 is that what's happened in the real world is that a lot of copyright owners have contractually built into their copyright licenses restrictions which take away the right that the Copyright Act gives you. So, for example, I was looking at the New York Times Terms of Use, and it clearly states that you cannot use the content for non-personal use. Basically, you can only use it for personal use. Whereas under the Copyright Act, fair use could potentially allow you to use it for commercial purposes. So what's happening is that corporate, not corporations, but contractually, certain rights are being removed from the users. And this is intended, this proposal, is to put in law, enshrine in law, the fact that you cannot contract out of exceptions in the Copyright Act. Now, okay. Well, the way it's been drafted is that we intended to give greater access to society. So there is a certain leaning towards that that people um, have greater access. But I, I was sort of looking at both ways because, you know, you can cut both ways. Anything that we discuss can cut both ways. So, for example, you know, um, if you're a content creator, you know, you might actually want to protect your work to an extent. And you do, you know, um, by a contract. Now, the issue that was raised at the um, seminar is we're only talking about Singapore law. Copyright law is territorial. And almost all, or a lot of the terms of use we see out there are governed by laws of other countries, namely, you know, US law. And <coughs> US law, US, you know, Singapore has no jurisdiction. We, our Copyright Act, these proposals have no effect. So, you know, US law. So at the end of the day, we're putting this in, but how many terms of use have we seen as an example that's governed by the laws of Singapore? I'm just using that as an example, something to think about. Can you can I you add? Oh, I guess um, so so basically what this proposal is about is that there's a recognition on the part of the law that uh, they do want to take uh, a little bit away from the starting position of freedom of contract, absolute freedom of contract for all copyright owners to decide how it is that their works are being used. So, Ling Law's intentions, I think the examples that they gave were, uh, you know, um, we might have exceptions under the Act which allow for um, conversion of books into a different format to allow for people with disabilities to access the work. But if you have as a contractual uh, position, a prohibition against that kind of provision, then of course these kinds of exceptions may then no longer be effective uh, because they've been contracted out of. Um, so I think like Brian 
says, um, uh, and, and of course the parish is kind of, uh, you know, uh, alluded to, there's probably perhaps some sense that, yes, there's some benefit for provisions of such a nature, but correspondingly, we also have to be very, very mindful that uh, if you, and I think this is also recognized within the New York Constitution, that if you allow for this to happen, if you take such a unique position uh, relative to other jurisdictions, then what's going to happen in turn is also people no longer have the right to choose in terms of what is a baseline set of rights. So you as a copyright owner, if you're licensing your material out to other people, you're going to be faced with the prospect that I cannot dovetail a license to direct it at a very specific type of use because at the back of my mind, um, you know, I cannot also be sure that this person is not going to invoke some kind of fair use exception and then try and override some of the restrictions that I have. So there is a recognition in the consult as well that a regime like this could lead to greater cost because owners will then be pricing licenses to take into account the fact that your baseline is going to be a very, very um, uh, broad kind of a range of uses. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at the questions, I think we need to <coughs> consider whether or not we agree that perceptions mm -hmm. under the Act should not be restricted by contractual terms. And I, I guess even from a CC, now wearing a CC hat perspective, uh, uh, the CC language has always been something that's founded on uh, uh, a framework that allows for users uh, sorry, owners to define the basis upon which you are ex given access to the work. Mm -hmm. The unique thing about CC licenses is already we have contractually built in in at least CC 4.0 specific statements to say that nothing in the licenses detract from your existing exceptions and limitations that you might have mm -hmm. under the act. So, you know, from our perspective, we feel that we have really uh, provided for a framework for people to allow them to use this stuff in a in, 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 in this manner. Uh, do we need to go further and go and mess around with contractual certainty? I'm really, really quite, uh, you know, I, th I think this is something that we need to think very carefully about. Can, can I ask a question? The question I would have is, is there a trend to go to look at the use contract as opposed to copyright? So just, I guess, I don't know whether so the, my, my favorite one I used in class is that you know the, 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 the show Bananas in Pajamas <laughs> B1 must stand next to B2 right? and B1 must on the left and B2 on the right you don't change your order it must be that way so it's written into a contract it's not apparently on the copyright it's a contract that you must when you come out and in the show or whatever you write to draw it out it must be in that form you know? mm -hmm. so so uh, the question that I have is is, is there increasing use of copyright to enforce uh, copyright so that it's it's very difficult to, to manipulate. Mm -hmm. you know, I can't change that. So, mm -hmm. if so, then they may not be so so good, you know, socially speaking, for society. Mm -hmm. But is there such a trend or not? I think if you look at Euler these days, there will be, for example, say education editions that will be in the context of the contract, right? Mm -hmm. But it also applies to quality. Yes, exactly. Right? So mm -hmm. if you have a, a provision like that to say, well, you cannot absolutely. Yeah, uh, you cannot do absolutely you know, yes. Right. You, you cannot uh, <coughs> prohibit that kind of thing to say if you bought an educational copy, you're also going to be able to access it for other fair uses, notwithstanding it may not be the education institute. Then I think an unintended effect may well be that those licenses may disappear or uh, they may become very expensive. So there's a very difficult set of balances here. Mm -hmm. I think we need to strike. Um, the other thing that we also probably need to think about is, whilst you may see that the questions just say certain exceptions in CC8, mm -hmm. if you yeah. look at the width of those exceptions, they are huge. Mm -hmm. Annex, Annex A. Annex A, uh, it, you know, it runs into practically everything that is an exception. You know, it talks about fair dealing generally, specific fair dealing. <coughs> educational institutions, libraries and archives, museums, gallery, mm -hmm. 
disabled users, old news users, or software specific exception, although admittedly that one is a bit unstable. Facilitating parallel imports, interface with designs, prior acts not infringing, temporary copy, not having the features. So it's a huge list here that we're talking about. So I, I, I personally don't know whether any other jurisdiction has, has something of this view. Most of the time, we have seen only a few of the exceptions within the Section 39 cluster relating to backup rights, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. you know, software, uh, backup copies backup of copies. software, decompilation for game related features. Okay. But can I just just throw a counter argument out there and just see how you feel about it? Um, isn't isn't an uh, argument in support of this proposal um, that it, it actually seeks to try and create more certainty um, for potential users of copyrighted works. Because if you allow for contracts to vary right so much, mm -hmm. then it's harder for users to know what they can and cannot do with a particular piece of work. They need to plow through reams of terms and conditions before they even start to use a work. Whereas, could it not be argued that if we preserve the sanctity of the Copyright Act exceptions, then users will know very clearly what they can and cannot do with a particular piece of, uh, with a particular work. Okay, my, my personal view yeah. is that uh, it probably uh, may be hard to apply some of these rules in practice because even today, I think one of the, the points that we generally concede about fair dealing in defenses even, for example, is that it's very fact-based, right? It's very situational. Mm -hmm. So what then does it mean if you have a fair dealing defense potentially arising on particular facts, mm -hmm. and then you have a provision at law which says that if you've got a contractual term that says something that that, that says that will that will in effect interfere with the fair dealing rules, that mm -hmm. it's going to be void. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be what you know, what is that you know uh, going to do for us in terms of addressing certainty? So I think there's a little bit of uh, it does need some thinking to this point. Mm -hmm. So what you're basically saying is not clear either way. I don't think that having a provision you know, so essentially saying that, oh, it's going to be void, which is what I think you're saying is going to do, then uh, is it necessarily going to promote certainty? I'm not sure. Like, if you start talking about fair dealing exceptions being so fact dependent and situational, right? Because you have uh, five factors or potentially four factors, depending on where this comes up. If you take out, if you get out from fair dealing and let's say you look at the education mm -hmm. exception, so that's clear situation. <laughs> then your education institution doesn't have to check each contract under which that work is done. So no, did I get <coughs> this right or not? Just go ahead and use. But I think in con the, besides the sanctity of copyright, there's also the question of sanctity of contracts. Mm -hmm. The freedom to put them or not. And sure. in a sense, doing due diligence to find out what the terms of the contract is par for the course is <coughs> something that we it should actually be built in into all the transactions. Because besides copyright, con uh, contract is already used to override so many other statutory mm. rights. And it, and I would argue that it's only in very, very particular situations, like for example, exclusion clauses, where you cannot contract out of personal reasons. Unfair contract. Yeah. Uh, unfair yeah. contract terms, right? yeah. That you would need to actually exclude mm -hmm. uh, contract. So in all other dealings, which, and this is mainly going to be uh, sort of quasi-commercial, we should not interfere with the ability of contract people mm -hmm. to contract out of it. Mm -hmm. But but we are we are we are assuming that there's uh, negotiation power is the same. So we are talking mm -hmm. about ULAs and AP that's most of them oh. don't have an option to negotiate or not. That's one. I, I think this is more geared towards users, right? Users who don't have the power to negotiate, users who may not even know that there's a, there are terms that they can Access or read the term 39.9 over percent people don't read terms anyway. Although when you talk about contractual principles, it's their fault. But I think you have to take into consideration the fact that these kind of terms restricting is really a one way thing uh, in, in a lot of cases. And I'm looking at it from the point of view of uh, these terms in EULAs or in contracts, which uh, between 
uh, companies, organizations, end users. I mean, if you're talking about C to C, yeah, I, I, I say then it's fair when you say that you have equal negotiation powers and you can and that it's fair and it's a contractual thing. So to me, it can also be a, when you're talking about fair and fair contract terms in which it's going to count. Uh, another current law on unfair contract terms is really uh, to protect a lot of it is consumer rights and everything. So I think this is more in line with that. So if we can have this, uh, if you take that into consideration, I feel that is possibly a, a good right. basis so, for this. So practically speaking, I mean, I, I, I fully empathize with the intent of the proposal, but for pr practical purposes, you know, copyright owners can easily, you know, subvert this by choosing a different law governing the contract. Mm -hmm. Right? So, it's very interesting to see whether if, if by contract it's just void, then you get into all sorts of legal questions as to whether or not it's legal that this sort of bonds is being void. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Where is that going to be as in terms of uh, contractual certainty? Mm -hmm. Is it important? Is there going to be a similar provision for instance in terms of uh, provisions limiting the ability to back up? That's right. So section 39 already says that a yeah, clause like that is void. Very specific. Can we yeah. just have two yeah. more points yeah. before we call for a vote? Mm -hmm. Because this brings the fair use is coming up. Right? I just have one comment perhaps in response to the following uh, comment just now. Maybe I hear you, all right? Uh, but equally, it, it does raise the other specter that even legal acknowledges its cost and the availability even of those kinds of technologies. I think um, as part mm -hmm. of that discussion, Perhaps also we need to consider whether there are alternatives to the sort of software that users without that bargaining power uh, might be wanting to use. Uh, today, I think even on the street, we are seeing, for example, Google Docs as an option to say something which is being quite used by some proprietary software house. So there are also, I think as part of this whole uh, equation, we need to think about market dynamics as well. I think, um, I might be wrong, but I think what Moon Law have, might have in mind is that they're looking at the future and they're looking at um, Singapore, Singaporeans, Singapore companies as being not so much consumers of copyright materials as creators and maybe eventually being in a position that they will be the ones you know, um, in that higher bargaining position. Mm. Maybe. So that, that might play a role in some of these suggestions that you are making. I think if you look at, I think I mean, if you look at most of these proposals, it does seem to me that they're trying to empower creators, you know, to sort of, you know, legitimately use copyrighted works to create something new. Yes. So yeah, it is intended to act as a sort of launch pad, as you as you say. So shall we take a vote? The question is, do you? Agree that certain exceptions should not be restricted. This is typical legal double negative. Yeah, double negative. <laughs> what, what am I actually <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those in favor of minus, of minus. contract. What? Those in favor of contract say yes. yes. Yeah, and then, yes. Huh? Do, status quo or change? Okay, status quo or change. Status quo means contract can override mm -hmm. statute. Sure. Um, change means contract cannot override statute. Okay, so those in favor of status quo. Okay, contract can override statute. Yeah, I mean that's status quo. So overall, everybody. Actually, I'm, I'm actually I'm, was the question asked at the forum where why they proposed this thing? Did did it did it even come up? Yes, uh, in the one that I attended, um, the question it was because they felt. That there might be certain rights which are which need to be enshrined and protected because From maybe consumer some perspective. consumers might not be in a good uh, bargaining position. But uh, I think from here we, we feel that consumer would that be better if they been doing something or some other place specifically addressing it and okay. it's been targeted to that particular thing that they want to perhaps in a consumer segment. Yeah, a special yeah. segment for consumer mm -hmm. how they should maybe unfair contracts term act part yeah. two or something. Yeah. yeah. But if that should be a free thing yeah. for consumers to yeah. freely rely on rather than something that's being generated. So just to, to uh, uh, perhaps.
share, I was there briefing and I do not know share the example of say an academic journal subscription service that says that you shall not without express written consent of the of the owner of the database use the data base uh, the data in conjunction with any data mining or transmission project or automated trend analysis application. So they can use the kind of broad term. Moving forward with this kind of a contractual restriction, they may not be able to uh, they, they may be avoided. So then the question then becomes if you're the owner of that of that data, then you would be quite concerned because you know you might have sold this license on certain assumption that you wouldn't be able to use the data. Okay, hmm. thank you. So that brings us next topic is fair mm -hmm. use of penalties for the contract. Yeah. <coughs> 